Hi guys, I am back with part two uh, with my two new friends, Shaul of Garment of Asav and Yura of Restoration of the Breach. And today we're gonna pick up where we left off in our last conversation from last Sunday. If you haven't listened to that yet, um, please go back and listen. We revealed many great secrets in that conversation. Many holy topics were covered. Um, today, uh, we're going to start out with the same safer. Your has it ready. So whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, shalom, everyone. Thank you for, for that wonderful introduction, Gila, and, and Garmin Basel for being here for this as well. So in our last uh, discussion, we we talked a lot about the Torah of Atsilus, but we didn't actually get the opportunity to discuss the secrets of the Torah of Atsilus and what actually that all entails. So I figured today I would do that. Um, so what we're looking at in front of us right now is a, a very esoteric sefer called Sefer Omek Hamalek. And this is by Rav Naftali. The Arizal had a few major disciples. Um, the main disciple of which, of course, was Chaim Vital and what many people um, are associated with. However, there were other disciples of the Arizal that also wrote Safers, and there's a lot of contingency back and forth about who was the authority, so on and so forth. Nonetheless, Raf Naftali was one of those individuals, and he wrote a incredible treatise called uh, Sefer Omech Hamalek, or the depths of the king. And a lot of what, what the Elon notes that we you mentioned in the first video, uh, they, they derive specifically from this tradition, from the tradition of Rav Naftali. We talk about the multiple simsumim. There are three major simsums. And these uh, simsumim, or this concept of the simsumim was really foundational to Omech Hamalek. So when you look at the various types of Elon note, by looking just in the beginning, if you see a square Simsum, for example, you can almost rest assured that it comes from this lineage specifically. So most of this, this treatise was written in Aramaic. And so therefore it's not accessible for most people, but the, the main corpus of it is written in Hebrew. Hashem. So, uh, before I touch on this real briefly, I'd like to uh, uh, bring us up to par with how to understand the Elons. So I brought another Sefer. This one is called uh, Genze Chaim, and it's all about Eitz Chaim. And inside of here, we have a Elon Gedol, or a great tree. Now, every major Kabbalist had an Elon including Ramphal and the others, because in order to study true Kabbalah, it requires one of these Elons. So here we are. So this is the beginning of it. It's the Sefer Elon Gedal. Then we have the Simsums. And of course, you can see here, there's a square Simsum on the very bottom. And this is a key that the lineage comes from Rav Mathali's lineage. Um, and of course, these are all various sections talking about the various parts of themes of um, Adam Kadman, so on and so forth. And then we actually hit the main parts of, of uh, the Elon, which of course would be Zerayin Pim. And then we have the worlds, so on and so forth. So this is just a basic example of an Elon. And then we have the clip, the roll of the Sia and the Klipoth. So you can see right here, of course, the names of the Klipoth, so on and so forth. But We'll go to the very top of the Elon and start there. So the very top of the Elon, it says um, the 231 Sha'im Panim. So Resh Lamed Aleph, which has a match of 231 uh, gates Panim, and then 231 Sha'im Acher. So these are the fronts and the backs. The 231 gates are made out of the 22 Hebrew letters. And so we'll find, um, you know, Aleph, Beit Gimel Dalit He Vav Zain Chet Tet Yud Kaf, and they're personified as Kether, Hokma Bina Daas Chesigavur Tifras Nesar Kol Yisad Malchus, and then we have the backside, which would be Mem Nun Samik Ayin Fe Sadi Kofreshin and Tav, and this would be 
um, the backside of Kether, the backside of Hokma, backside of Beaner, backside of Das, etc. The 22 letters essentially personify what are called the 11 fronts and the 11 backs of the Sefirot. Now, what's important to understand about this is, it, as we can see at the top, it says Or Ein Sof, which means the light of the endless. And this is also above the Tehiru, right? So it says here, uh, the Sefirot shall Olam Chamel Bush that these are the spheros of the universe of the garment. And this garment is, is critical to understand because it, the understanding of it is that it refers to the 22 letters. And this is what is written. He wraps himself in light. And then similarly, it's written S Ha'or. And so Et Ha'or means the 22 letters, Aleph to Tav, the light. Numerical value of the word light is the same value as Ein Sof. Ein Sof. So Ein Sof has a numerical value of 270, 207, and that's the same as numerical value of the word light, or it's also the same numerical value as the word Raz, meaning secret. And that is the secret of the endless, is the light, specifically the 22 letters. So one of the, the most critical things to understand about the Elon is that at the apex of the Elon, of any true Elon, you're going to find 22 letters. The Zohar says very uh, varying things about this, but it states that essentially the 22 letters are something beyond the capacity of mankind, beyond the capacity of angelic beings and supernal beings, and states that um, the only one who will understand them in the world to come is Mashiach, and that Mashiach will come to reveal the secret of the 22 letters. And that's, that's one of his core functions. And this is actually hinted at directly um, in the writings of our prophets because it says, I'll give them to them a new pure language. And this, this pure language, of course, refers to Lashon HaKodesh. So with that basic prior fundamental understanding, the 231 gates here are actually mentioned in Omech HaMalek. So we'll jump over there right quick and then we'll get into some actual secrets and mysteries and begin to see what the Torah of Atzilus really is and why it's so significant. So in Omech Hamala, in uh, Sha'ar Aleph, Gate 1, we actually have the 231 gates. Now, the description here of this is accordingly to create a golem. And many people say that Omech Hamala is the only safer that actually gives the instructions on how to create the golem. But the numerical value of golem is 73. Gimel, Lam, and Men. This is the same numerical value as the word hokma, hokma, because essentially Adam was a golem before he came to life, as Tehillim tells us, as the Psalms tells us, right? And so there's a great mystery behind this. So what we find here when we look at the 231 gates, according to Sefer Yetzirah, it says Aleph with every letter, every letter with Aleph, Bait with every letter, every letter with Bait, they repeat in a cycle, so on and so forth, like a wall. Etc. 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 It says the circles oscillate back and forth, which the word there is panim be'acher, which really means to say fronts and backs. Thus, we find you know parts of kether aleph, parts of hokma beit, parts of bina gimel, parts of das is the letter dalit, etc. And it continues down this lineage. This also tracks what will eventually be the breaking of the vessels. But we see parts of kether achor lamet. So we continue all the way down. So we go Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vaz, Nechat, Yud, Kaf. As we see, parts of Malchus, Kaf. And then we get to the backside of Kether, which is Lera Lame. And the backside of Pachma, which is Mem, so on and so forth. And so we can see that here in Omech Hamalek, the idea of the fronts and backs of the Sfirot and their attribution with the Hebrew letters is being presented. And this is the source for the beginning of the top of those Elons. Now, what I'd like to do from here is to actually get into how we can actually begin to see all of these things. So we'll go. We'll go into one of the Elons that I brought, I think. So this particular Elon, um, to give si uh, perspective of size, uh, I suppose here's my, my hand so you can get an idea of how wide it is. I would say it's probably about a, a foot, maybe a foot and a half wide. And the scroll of the Elon itself is about 45 feet long. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with the very, very top of it. 
and then we'll move from there and I'll, we'll actually get into some of the actual atsu. Um, Where did you get this from? Where is this? How did you acquire this one? I, 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 so I've written all of my Elon. Um, so this particular, and this is a double sided, mind you. So usually I'll show you the backside of it. The entire oh. is a double sided. How long did that take you? Seven days and seven nights um, to produce 45 feet. You didn't sleep? Um, I did about 16 hours a day and then I would sleep for the remaining and then I'd wake up and repeat this, the process. Yeah. Wow. 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 Um, so, and, and this is imperative, especially when it comes to Kabbalah. Um, a lot of people will, will probably attempt to disagree with me, but nonetheless, um, to any person to teach true Kabbalah, real Kabbalah, it requires an Elon. And that's how the ancient, tradition was anyone who's received from from a lineage they would have to produce an elon um as i stated even ramkal himself produced uh elanot and he actually has uh elon i can actually share it with you maybe later um but okay so we'll get to the very top of it and we'll start off there so we have at the very top uh the 22 hebrew letters you can see aleph to tav we see at the very top ani and ain so Ain has a permutation of the word Ani. Ani is a self-identifier. It essentially means I. Ani Hashem means I am Hashem. And Ain, essentially, we understand means nothing. And so one of the interesting dichotomies between Ain and Ani is this idea we think that Ain is not knowable. And yet it serves into the word Ani, which means I am. Furthermore, Ani is one of the names of Malchus. And Ain is one of the names of Kether. And Malchus ascends into Kether. And so there's a direct lineage between Malchus and Kether because Malchus is called a shining mirror. It's also called Yam Sof. And so it's at the end and it reflects, it reflects all of the upper orders where she's everything. So we see something that appears to look with the appearance of a cross. No affiliation or no association with Christianity whatsoever. But nonetheless, um, we find that the Paleo Tav is in the image of a cross. Now, it happens to take this shape, um, and the original shape of it is is designed from Sefer Yetzirah, in which it says 22 um, letters of the Lishon Kodesh, the foundation of everything. There are three mothers, which are Aleph, Mem, and Shin. And there's a Mem Sophis. There's seven double letters, which are Beit, Gimel, Kaf, Fe, Tav, Resh, Dalit. And there are what are called 12 elementals. And so the 12 elementals are what, unfortunately or fortunately, give us that shape. That's because we know that Aleph, Mem, Shin, and Mem, Sofit personify elements, right? Aleph is from Avir, which means air. Mem is from Mayim, meaning water. Mem, Sofit is like a Damas, like the earth or the ground. And Shin is from Esh, it's fire. Thus, the 12 elementals means that there are three simple letters to every mother letter. And that just happens to take that shape when we, when we create the form. So that, so at the very top of it, we find the Sikha Lushona Kodesh. And their arrangements are very particular, very specific. The Zohar teaches that in the temple, the 22 letters dwell alone, and the entire temple was created through the letters alone, just as the entire existence was created through the letters alone. It states with every letter having a particular place. So Sefer Yetzir teaches that there are three mothers, seven doubles, and 12 elementals. So we'll begin with just the three mothers, which are Aleph, Mem, and Shin. Aleph meaning the air, Mem meaning the water. We know its Sophie form is the earth, and Shin is the fire. So the general idea here is that Aleph separates men from Shin, or that the air separates liquids and solids from the light. They're called mother letters because, in, in essence, they hint to the faculties of speech. For example, Aleph is to the throat, which makes the sound letter A, A. Mem is to the lips, which makes the sound letter M like this. Mm. And Shin it corresponds to the tongue, makes the sound letter S like this. S. Now, even at a frequency level, we find that the mid frequency, which is the throat or aleph, uh, separates the low frequency, the lips, making the sound of mem, from the high frequency, shin, which is, corresponds to the tongue. 
on a frequency level, we're going to see this. So Aleph separates mem from shin, or the air separates liquids and solids from the light. Now, this is our first key, and then we'll get into some explosive, explosive revelations, which I haven't revealed to, I don't even think I'm on my own channel yet. So to do that, we'll go to the very top of Elon and go through and see what that actually means. So the top of this scroll, we're going to see Aleph separates mem from shin. So we see that the eyes that see the light principle of shin are separated from the mouth, taking liquids and solids, mem and mem sophit, from the nose that breathes the air, and ultimately the ears that receive sound by the air. So what's important about, about this concept is it's written, by the word of his mouth, he created the heaven and the earth. So it doesn't just come to include the heaven and the earth, but it comes to include everything <clears throat> in the heaven and the earth. So we'll go down. We'll see the image of an angel. So in the Zohar, it tells us the angels do not know the secret of the letters, nor do the supernal beings. And that's because if you look at the structure of the angel, you have eyes on top of the nose, nose on top of the mouth, or eyes that see the light separate from the mouth, liquid solids by the nose that breathes the air. Same thing with the body structure. The brain, which moves the body via light, separate from the stomach, processing liquids and solids by the lungs that breathes the air. Now, this is at the level of not only the reality, but also in our dreams. So see land and sea separated from the stars above by the atmosphere. So the principle that I'm talking about doesn't just define our reality. It defines what's above us. So we'll head down and we'll see. Now, this is uh, applicable to every single face in existence. Right? Every person's eyes that see the light will be separated from their mouth, taking liquids and solids by their nose that breathes the air. And same thing with the body. Their brain will move their body via light separated from their stomach, processing liquids and solids by their lungs that breathe the air. The same thing will occur with the animals. The animals will be eyes on top of the nose, nose on top of the mouth, head on top of the lungs, lungs on top of the stomach. So it transcends planes of correspondence. It also transcends the environment because land and sea will be separated from the stars above by the atmosphere. It also comes to include every plant, because every plant will receive its color from the light, separated from its roots in the earth drawing water by its leaves converting atmospheric substance. So we're looking at environment, we're looking at plant, we're looking at animal, we're looking at people. And ultimately, it comes down to include uh, the universe itself, because every planet is a body of solids or liquids and solids separated from a centralized star by space. And so this, this transcends, you know, hundreds of billions of galaxies. And then if it does, the planets are like this and the environments are like this and the life forms are like this, it can only mean that the law that we're looking at superseded and proceeded the dimension itself. Because if the dimension is defined by this law, then the law had to supersede the dimension. Now, where it gets amazing is when you take it to other dimensions. So we can see these things in our dreams because the same law is applicable in our dreams. Aleph separates men from shin, eyes on top of the nose, nose on top of the mouth, head on top of the lungs, lungs on top of the stomach. We'll see the same thing in our dreams. This right here is a depiction of shale, gainon, because it also is applicable there. So we can see the various shadim, but they're all by the same laws, both the environment, the form, and the individuals. So this is just the very, the most basic level. But let's get into a higher level. Let's get into some interesting things. So we'll move over. We understand Ayla separates men from Shin, and we can see that now a little bit clear here. We can see it on the face. We can see it in the planets. We can see it in the environment. We can see it in the plants. And that begs the question, if we were able to see that, how would we treat each other? If we were actually able to see the divinity in each other, then how would we uh, view each other? Would we view each other with resentment? Would we view each other with hatred? Would we judge each other, so on and so forth? Or would we see the divine in each other and celebrate our differences? The same thing with the environment. How would we treat the environment if we saw the divine when we were in the environment? Would we feel like we were alone? Or would we feel the embrace of the endless? How would we treat the plants? How would we treat the animals if when we looked at the animal, we actually saw the divine. So the placements of the letters are very particular. 
So for example, Aleph and Mem. I, I mentioned to you that this is the throat, ah, and the lips, mm. So we see one of the seven double letters here, which we'll take letter bait, for example. So if you try to make the sound of the letter bait, ba, can you make the sound of the letter bait without your lips and throat? No. This is because Aleph combined with men create bait. Bait in Hebrew means house. And so now I'm going to ask you a question. Does the air house water? So we look at like a hieroglyphic, right? So house, we can see it. I'll give you an example. Like letter B in English, we see house, which is bait in Hebrew. We see it like in the word B in bag, B in box. Right? Because a bag houses something and a box houses something. But if we look at it like a hieroglyphic, we say air houses water. So then the question does does hair does does the air house the water? And the answer is yes. When we go outside, we see that air houses water. And in fact, we can see that in in the Hebrew word for hevel, which is another word for breath. Breath. And because the letter B in the word breath means what? That the air houses the water. And so if I was to take a breathalyzer test, what are they looking for? The alcohol content. Right. So, for example, so let's take it backwards. So if it's true, it can't just be forwards. Air, house, water has to go backwards. Water, house, air. So does the water house the air? We can see that like in the in the word bubble. Letter B in the word bubble means water houses air. So we can take it. We can then take it as as letter B, for example, as we did by itself, box, bag, so on and so forth. We can do it with Aleph by itself, like the word balloon, which would mean to house air. But let's take the letter B and apply it with the water right there, right? And we're looking at it from the phonetic structure. You can see why they're called mother letters, because essentially the, the lungs, lips, and tongue are, are how every other sound are pronounced. And, and you can't pronounce any sound without one of these three faculties or a combination of those faculties. So uh, we'll take letter B and water. So for example, the word body in English. So the letter, the, the letter B in the word body teaches us what? It teaches us that the body is made out of water. And it's a scientific fact. So when I blink, what am I doing? Putting water on my eye. When I give birth, what breaks? Water. A baby, letter B tells me, housed in water. Breasts, same thing, produces water. So the brain, even the word blood, air houses water because the blood has to be oxygenated. And so what we begin to see is that the letters don't only just have fixed placements, but these fixed placements reveal the very essence and nature of existence itself. And, the, and, and so when we continue with that type of an idea, then we can bring in deeper uh, levels. So for example, I'll, I'll give you another example. So for example, like the letter kaf, right here's over here with Cyrus Shin. So you try to make the sound of kaf, ka, or which would be C in English, ka, you'll notice that you cannot make it without your tongue. Right? And so we can see it, for example, we see it between Shin and Mim. So shin, which means fire, has one of two sounds, like an S. And it also has a sh sound, as we know in Hebrew. So an S, we can see it like in English. That's meaning fire, like the word sword, which tells us what, that it was forged in the fire. What about the word sun? The word sun, which means the ball of fire. Seasons or summer, because summer is the hottest month, because it's coming from fire. Now, it has another sound, S-H, shin. Sh. So this is a covering for the light. And we can see that sound, a covering for the light, which is S-H. So we, if you go anywhere in the world and say, shh, right? It's covering, being like quiet. Or like sheath, sh, right? Or shorts, sh shirt, shade. Right, so all of these words. So <clears throat> we can do, thus derive from letter C in between these and using the same using the same hieroglyphics 
um, symbols that I was referring to earlier that we learned with air house water, we can see a covering of light upon solids, covering of light upon solids. So then we can look at words like Kohen, a Kohen high priest or a priest. What does a priest deal with Kohen? Covering of light on solids, he should burn offering. Burn offering. But let's take a look at it. For example, we can see it in the phonetic structure of the word color. The letter C in the word color teaches us what? It's a covering of light on solids. So then, so then ask the question, is color a covering of light on solids? Okay, then look at the word camera. If I have a camera, what does a camera do? Captures light on solids. So I could be a caveman living, in a, living off somewhere and never having exposure to humanity. And if someone said, what is a camera? I could tell them it's a covering of, to capture covering of light on solids. And the same thing we can see with, with crayon. Again, covering of light on solids, so on and so forth. And so the general idea behind the letters as we at the highest level is that they all have a fixed position. And the fixed position of the letters have to deal with the phonetic structures. And these phonetic structures then in turn hint to hidden laws about how to navigate them. And then they have high levels of interaction. So that's the first level, and we'll move into a different level, the Elon. The next level is the concept of the Simsuma restriction. Are you familiar with the restriction? Can I ask you before we move on? Sure. How is it that the English language fits so seamlessly with the Hebrew letters? So um, so at the highest level, the Shona Chodesh is, is actually not <clears throat> phonetic at all. I, I, in fact, as we know, the Hebrew language cannot actually be pronounced without without a uh, nikud, because the nikud are the vowels, and so there's a reason for this. The Zohar tells us that what separates Israel from all the other nations is that they were given a script, and so then therefore this script is what separates it. So the Torah was not passed down through oral tradition, meaning that it's not something that's memorized because it's not something that could be phonetically transferred, but rather it was written down. And there's a great reason behind that, because at the highest level, every one of the Hebrew letters represents symbols. And so I gave the I gave an uh, example similar to a hieroglyphic, where a hieroglyphic essentially is a character that has a symbolic meaning. The Hebrew letters, so too, are characters or glyphs that have a, 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 a particular meaning. And their arrangements, when you analyze the meanings in their arrangements, they reveal secrets about reality. And so with that understanding, then we should see that when you understand them as symbolic or, um, or like uh, representing um, ideas, then we can see them as information. And so then at the highest level, this is the background information behind every single language. And in fact, it goes and transcends every other language. So for example, like the letter Nun, for example, which we can see over here from the water, Nun, we see um, as an example that Nun or Nunan in, in Hebrew means uh, a fish. This is in Japanese, though, the word for mermaid is Ningyo. And so the letter Nun in Ningyo tells us it's a fish. Or we can see like in the type of sushi called Nagiri, Nagiri. And that's because the Na, the Na sound. And so then at the highest level, what we're actually looking at is, is the idea that frequency is embedded with information. And every language is a communication system of varying uses of frequency. But the frequency itself is embedded with information. And so then therefore, no matter what language we're using, it can only be communicated using the faculties of tongue, lips, and throat. And so when we're looking at it at that level, then all of the nations are using some derivative of this system. And so then therefore there are 70 nations which correspond to the 70 interpretations of Lashon HaKodesh. Mm. And so that teaches us that one, Hashem speaks every language because of this exact reason, because no, no person could speak any language without using the faculties of the divine Lashon HaKodesh. And two, 
it's it, it you can see that it transcends all of these languages because the Japanese culture certainly didn't have contact with the Jews, so on and so forth. And yet, as I just gave two examples in the term ningyo, meaning mermaid, we can see the letter nun being used as fish or nigiri, where the letter nun is being used as a fish, so on and so forth. And we see the letter nun in English, I mean, obviously, like in the word navy, because the navy deals with the sea. And so then, and so then the idea that this lends back to the idea that human beings aren't the originators of our thoughts, but rather we are receivers of our thoughts. Our thoughts actually originate in a higher reality. And so then higher than all of that, the reality of where we receive our thoughts from is the archetypes or the principles behind thought, which is the information embedded in the frequency that we receive. And so that's where the Lashona Kodesh actually takes takes its role at. And so then therefore we're looking at the background, um, the background program, you know, like the matrix behind everything. And then everything is just a derivative of that, whether they're aware of it or not, or whether they're culturally aware of it or not, is completely, completely to the side. But nonetheless, it does, it transcends every single culture. And it's what unites every single culture. Thank you. Of course, of course. So, so we'll go to the concept of, of the Simpson. So you're familiar with the restriction, the idea that the endless had extended to the boundary of the endless. There was no end to its boundary. <clears throat> when it arose in his desire, he might bring forth creation, so on and so forth. He restricted his presence. He restricted his light. From all directions, the endless restricted itself precisely in the center, creating a vacancy where there was no vacancy. And at the highest level, we want to scrutinize these things and get to the inner levels. So we find if the light actually did uh, restrict itself at the highest level in a different every direction, this would create a circle. So we should actually see evidence of this stuff because it's written by Adat Hashem, and you'll know that I am God and I acknowledge. And in fact, we do. Because when we go to the highest level of reality, for example, planets on the planetary level, we find that planets are circulating, circling stars. And how are the planets circling stars? If you look at all the planets in our universe, they're concentric circles. And they're evolving. And at the smallest level, everything should also be circular. So when we go to the smallest level, we find that electrons are circling protons and neurons separated by space. So all of separates them from Shin, right? Electrons are separated from protons and neurons by space. We find that electrons are circling. So at the highest level of reality, we find that everything is circular. And at the lowest level of reality, we find everything is circular. The continuation begins. It says, we then learn about the aura yashar, the straight light. We learn the light pours in. Obviously, it would pour in from all directions because the light would be surrounding. And that teaches us something. If the light poured in, if, we, if, if the light was poured into the restriction and the restriction was from all directions, what would that teach us? It teaches us that light is circular. So then when we shine a light, is the light emit circularly? The concentrate circles, according to Chaim Vital, are the secrets of the Nikud, the Nikudim, or the vowels or the points. Well, the Nikud, which are the vowels, hints to sound. And so then what does that teach us about sound? It teaches us that sound emits circularly. So when we look at sound, we see it vibrating in the likeness of a circle. And the same thing with the light. We see the light and the likeness of a circle. So these are two other laws that we can begin to see, or actually four laws. We can see that light, we can see that there's a circular aspect at the highest level. Planets, an example, circling stars. At the lowest level, electrons, an example, circling protons and neutrons. We can see that light is circular. We can see that sound is circular. And so when the light begins to pour in, it's called aura yashar, or the straight light. And so we learn something from that as well. We learn that on the highest level, everything is circular. On the lowest level, everything is circular, but everything in between is linear. So that means that we are linear constructs that are composite of circular aspects 
existing within a larger circular aspect. So that means we're linear and we're created out of, out of atoms, which are electrons circling protons and neutrons and so forth, existing within planets that are circling stars. Right? And so on the lowest level, everything is circular. At the highest level, everything is circular. Everything in between the lowest and highest level is linear. So, of course, when it hits in the in, in, at the smallest level, it's the 231 gauge of the hard spark. We find the 22 letters are there. We should find evidence at the smallest level of existence of the 22. And in fact, we do. Because when we go to the smallest level of, of reality, we find that we find that there are 22 chromosomes to the human DNA, right? So if it was indeed the 22 letters that restricted its light in the very beginning, when we get to the smallest level of things, we should find some type of evidence for that. And we do, because when we look at the human DNA, we find there are 22 chromosomes and the 23rd chromosome is a genetic factor. So the 22 chromosomes are synonymous with the 22 Hebrew letters. And so we'll get into two concepts or two two levels to help explain some of the ideas. So first, the 231 gates that we talked about where the 22 letters were Aleph is Kether, Beta is Hokma, so on and so forth. All of the letters are synonymous with the 11 fronts of the Sephirot and the 11 backs of the Sephirot. So we see that um, when, we, when we do place them in this in this arrangement, we see Aleph, Bey, Gimel, Dalai, Hei, Vazen, Chetet, Yid, Kaf. But then we find it goes backside of Lamed, backside of Mem, backside of Nun. And what's really interesting is when we see this progression between from Malchus, which is letter Kaf, to the backside of Kether, which is the letter Lamed, what is the connection that we find here? Well, this is all hinted at in Genesis because it's written that he made, he does, it doesn't just say he made the man, it says he made Eta Adam. At the man, Aleph to Tav, the man. And so that teaches us that the man is made in the secret of this shape. And what is that? We find that the connection between Malkuth and Kath, when we scrutinize that, we find is hinted at where it says, and he will bruise the heel, an example, Malchus, and he will bruise the head, an example, Kether. So the bruised heel and the bruised head, an example, is hinted at here. But the real secret is that this entire tree, which is called the tree of the fronts, or pani, which means face, is found in this one spherot of the tree of the back, an example, kether. So this is the concept we use. It, um, it's uh, eight al eight, or tree on top of tree. The idea is that this entire tree of the front is in this one spherot of the tree of the back. The best way to understand this is if you can imagine this is the tree of the body. So this is the head, right? And this is the feet. So the tree of the body as you can kind of see a, a general idea here, tree of the body. And in the Kether is this entire tree of the fronts. Now the word front here, Pani means face. So we can see that Hokman and Bina are the two lobes of the brain, right? The eyes, the nose, the ears, and the mouth. So we have a tree of the face in the Kether of the tree of our body. So this creates a um, archetypal image that precedes all of reality. So we saw earlier about Aleph separates them from Shin of the face and Aleph separates them from Shin of the body. The same concept is captured there because ultimately Shin is Keter, Okma, Bina, and Da'as. Aleph is Chesed, Gavur, and Tiferet. Mem is the top of the water. Mem is Netzach, Ho, the base as you saw it. And the Mem Sophie is Malchus. Right. And so one thing it teaches is that before even the spherot of emanation, which we call the tree of Atsilus, um, before the, the spherot of emanation, Ela separates them from Shin existed because Ela separates them from Shin defines the tree of Atsilus. But another level of it is that when we go back and look at some of the, the secrets of Ela separates them from Shin we analyzed before, an example, Ela from Shin of the face and Ela from Shin of the body, we can see the same concept of the tree of the face in the kether of the tree of the body. And this is because it doesn't just say Adam, it says Eta Adam. And this is what it meant that he would 
be ruler over her, the woman, because the woman is synonymous with the backside, an example of the body. And the man is synonymous with the tree of the face. And so the tree of the face governs the body, etc. This is also why they couldn't face each other, look at each other, so on and so forth. So when we actually look at the diagram of the body or this diagram of the tree, we find there's a left column, a right column, and a center column. I'll touch on some of the, uh, the, the keys that we can see as osteolithic interpretation as opposed to the normal interpretations. So the right column is white, the left column is red, and the middle column is yellow. So the top of the right column is the sphere of Hokma, which goes by the part two thing called Abba. Abba means father and hints of the male. So what does this teach us? It teaches us that the right column that every male produces, white, white, right, white. Now, if we go back here, we see bait is hokma, yes? So the breasts produce what? White. The male, the male reproductive organ, they balls, so on and so forth, produce white. Boy, because it produces white. Mem is the backside of Hokma means male. Male produces white. Man, white. And Hokma gives life to its possessor. So that whiteness is life. Chaya. And so then Gimel, you see, is, is Bina. That's the top of the left. Girl. Girl. And so girl produces red. Because the left column is red. And the top left column is Ima. And so every woman produces red. So we see this is bone and flesh. And so I'll give you an understanding. So a normal understanding is to have wisdom and understand, understand wisdom. That's written in Sifi Yitzira. And so the basic interpretation could be interpreted like, okay, this is how I should process information, so on and so forth. But to have wisdom and understanding and to understand wisdom, a particular Atsi Luthic level, to have wisdom and understanding means to have bone in the flesh. Yeah. So then I ask you a question. Is wisdom and understanding, is bone in the flesh? Can you ask me that again? <laughs> so so if, if, if wisdom refers to the bone on the right column and flesh is the left column and the top of this is understanding, yeah. then to have wisdom and understanding could be interpreted now at the Osteoluthic level as to have bone, wisdom, in understanding in the flesh. So then I ask you, is bone in the flesh? Yes. Okay. Now now I said to have wisdom and understanding to understand in wisdom. So then is flesh in the bone? An example like bone marrow. Yes. Right. And so now do you see the difference in interpretation from the person who hears to have wisdom and understanding? And then all of a sudden they take reality as a witness. What can I take as a witness to you? What can I liken to you? And they see, okay, God tells me wisdom is understanding. So bone is in the flesh. And then I look at creation and I say, oh, yeah, bone is in the flesh. And then I say, oh, to understand in wisdom. And now it says to have flesh and bone. And, uh, and then I see that. Yeah. So so that's an example of, the, of, of how to interpret. And, and, and you can see that, that the interpretation of to have wisdom and understanding and to understand in wisdom and it's normal Peshat could just mean whatever you want it to mean. It could be some type of way of processing information. But at the Atsiluthic level, it's it's those people aren't even playing the same game anymore and they're not they're not in the same universe so the set so for example the center is yellow so if it's written man is a tree so this is the human body as we were talking about so then the center of the body produces yellow so then do we pee it's yellow stomach acid yellow phlegm in our lungs yellow teeth plaque boogers earwax eye crust, it's yellow. And so then this is what I was referring to when I was starting to talk about the Atsiluthic Torah. Because Atsiluthic Torah, the word Atsil means emanation. And so then the idea of the emanatory level of existence, the emanatory levels of existence, which then supersede and transcend all of the other interpretory levels, because it comes with the knowledge of Hashem. And that's where it transcends um, religion, because at these levels we're talking at, we're not dealing with faith, we're not dealing with belief, but we're dealing with das, knowledge. So there, so there are many, 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 many deep levels that we could go into that would explain deeper levels about some of this atzil. But 
every single level of the Elon has to deal with that. Ultimately, this skull, this this hard spark is what's called the skull of the Ancient of Days. The skull. And what's fascinating about that skull, how many bones do you think we have in our skull? I don't know. 22. 22. I should have yeah. guessed that. <laughs> Yeah, no, without without question. And so and and so then we talk about the seven kings of Edom that emerged, which are the seven letters in the Hebrew alphabet that have Tagen, Shin Tet, Nun, Ein, Zain, Sadi, Gimel. And so how many holes do we have in our skull? Seven. Exactly. Placed exactly in twenty-two. Hmm. Exactly. And so then so then we begin to construct which is what is called the Atik Yoman, the ancient of days. As Daniel hints at, our sages say that Daniel was not a prophet because he was a sage. Mm. He was a sage. And a sage is preferred over a prophet because sage mm. makes more. Like so, so these so these three levels that I hinted at, the the surrounding endless, the restriction, and the hard spark are what are called the upper eye. It's the upper eye. So the surrounding endless, the restriction, and the hard spark. So what does this teach us about the structure of our eye? White, color, black. Mm -hmm. And so the pupil is black. Surrounding the pupil is the iris of color. And surrounding that is the square of the whiteness. So all of these intricate levels that we talk about, and then as we know that the secret of the heart's bark, which are the 231 gates, because when you combine Aleph with every letter and every letter with Aleph, this is done symbolically through lines. You create 231 lines. When you do this, um, we know that the secret of this are the secret of the fronts and backs of the sphere. Oh, this mirrors our skull, which is 22 bones, and the two lobes of our brain, left and right. Like this. So then when, when Moshe said that he spoke panim to panim, face to face, it hints to that upper face. And that's that's one of the terms of partsuf. Partsuf can be interpreted as a face. And so the idea of the elans is it creates the construction of the upper faces, specifically of atik and of a rikain pin, so on and so forth, the beard and so on and so forth. And they look very abstract to those that are not familiar with the ways of the um, inner workings of Kabbalah. But for those that do not understand the inner workings of the Kabbalah, they see that everything is in the secret of this chamber. Everything is in the secret of the body of the king. Everything is in the secret of the Atik, the Partufs. And when you begin to see that, then you take those things back into reality and begin to see them. So we've learned, you know, an incredible amount of things. For example, we learned that the there's, um, that the light restricted itself to a centralized point on the smallest level. So we went to the smallest level. We saw evidence. There's 22 chromosomes. We see as the skull of the ancient day, we see our skull as 22. You know, the light would pour in and strike this place. So as, as the Oriya shark goes in, it strikes this hard spark. Interestingly enough, we find right at the top of our skull, it's a soft spot. When the seven kings of Adam emerge from that hard spark, which is synonymous with the seven holes in our skull. We learn at the smallest level, everything's revolving. At the highest level, everything's revolving. We learn that sound is circular. We learn that light is circular. We learn that the left column produces red. Every female produces red. The right column produces white. Every man produces white. We learn the center column is yellow. And we can actually see evidence of that stuff. So it's not something that we actually have to take. Um, we have to believe in or have faith in. So I'll show you um, another concept of that. We can actually apply it into one of the verses inside of the Torah, I suppose. Can I ask a question before you continue? Sure, sure. So I've heard that part of the uh, ascension or trias hamesim, or I'm not sure what process it's part of, but that our DNA will be reactivated, that our DNA was downgraded as a result of of the original eating of the apple. So when you say the 22 letters will come to life, does that mean the DNA will also 
correspondingly? Absolutely. And there's actually evidence of this. So for example, if a person has a pessimistic view of surviving cancer, they're it, it, it's been proven that their chances of surviving cancer are just slashed. So if a person has a pessimistic view and they're like, oh my God, I'm going to die and they're stressing out and all of these other things, then their chances of living have just been limited extraordinarily. So what this teaches us is that our state of consciousness actually affects our cellular development. In fact, there are actually many studies that have proven that stress, when we stress out, we actually produce this chemical that is, is uh, cancerous mm. in our body. It's a carcinogen. And uh, it also causes aging and all of these other horrific types of things to occur to us. So the, the general idea behind what I just stated is that our state of consciousness affects our cellular development, our cellular reproduction. And so then therefore, if our state of consciousness ascends to see the divine, then our our cells will also be affected by the state of consciousness and ultimately change the way they interact um, and, and how they redevelop and so on and so forth. And so the idea that you're, you're positing is, is one that, that definitely aligned there. And, and I, I'll show, I'll share with you that golden Elon in just a moment. I know that you asked about that. And I want you to share how it, you came in into your possession, if you were comfortable with that. Sure, sure. So I, I, um, so there, there was essentially a, a miracle that occurred, and um, somebody had messaged me, and they were going through something absolutely horrific, and uh, I'm not going to go into the names of the of who this person was or anything like that, but let's just say they basically said like, life is so miserable. And they reached out to me and, you know, I get a lot of messages. Um, I have quite a large following, I have like 125,000 followers on TikTok. So when people do reach out to me um, and I get a lot of them, I can't always get to them. A lot of them get filtered, so on and so forth. But for whatever reason, this person was in, 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 insistent about trying to get hold of me. And um, their message basically read, I am losing all hope and I don't have anything to live for. You're the only person I think that can help me. If you get back, to, if you do not get back to me, I'm going to kill myself and kill my child. That's basically what they said. And uh, obviously, um, you know, most people on that would be like, okay, well, what do you do? You know, obviously, oh, let's call law enforcement, so on and so forth. Well, this person does live in the country. So it, this isn't a situation where it's like, oh, yeah, okay, I can call law enforcement and say, hey, this person wants to kill themselves and their child. Um, I can't really do that. So nonetheless, um, what do you do in such a situation? In a lot of situations, when I get a, get messages from people, you know, I get crazy messages, you know, like I'm the angel of this, I'm the reincarnation of Yeshka, you know, like all kinds of craziness. And so I usually just ignore all of that because I feel that a lot of the uh, community is filled with like mental, um, I don't know, um, like psychosis. And, uh, but nonetheless, I saw this person's message and I felt they were serious about what they were saying. So I responded back and, um, and I, I, I asked, you know, what was wrong and what exactly was going on? And they, they reached out and said, you know, I don't have a will to live anymore. I, uh, my life is complete misery and suffering. I have a son. I can't stand to see him live like this anymore. And I'm giving up on everything and I need to know that something is real. And if I can't be proven that something is real, then I have no will to live anymore. If I don't have any will to live anymore, I'm going to take mine and my child's life. It's basically what they said. So I emailed this person back and I said, um, you know, do you have an email? And uh, they said, yes. And they sent me an email and I sent to them um, a very special document that I have called the world peace document. And the world peace document reveals the secrets of Ayla separates men from Shin, something that I shared with you a little bit in the beginning of this video. And um, I shared it in the language that they could understand. And I, um, I believe they spoke Spanish. So I had a version of it in Spanish and sent it over there. And nonetheless, to show that there is a God, that Hashem is real. They might not understand the mass Hashem, but to understand that there is a God, God is real. And, uh, and that, that there's something more to life than misery and suffering. So I sent them an email, explained them what to do, sent them the document, told them, said, hey, take 10 minutes, look through each thing, and sit down and just view it. If, I mean, if, if your life is at the point, you know, 
I didn't say this exact, I didn't say this part that I'm telling you right now, but the logic behind it is if your life is to a point to where there's nothing left to lose and you're going to kill yourself, then what are the odds of just sitting down and seeing if they're, if what this guy's saying is real or not. And so I sent him the world peace document and uh, they read it and they didn't get back to me for like a day or two. But they ended up getting back to me and they said, you know, I read the document and I see it. I see, I see the truth. I see the light. I see, I see God and everything. And uh, they changed their tune to what they wanted to do. And so after this, and, and, and before this, I had sent a message in, um, in, the, in a private group. And I said, I said, you know, you guys should be thankful for every day that you have to live. And the importance of studying the Torah is that Hashem sometimes sends us um, tests. And sometimes these tests will come in either through on, on the side of Kedusha or it'll come on the side of the, of the Yetzirah. You know, the Satan will send somebody. And Satan will be like, oh, yeah, this soul right here, we're going to, we're going to, Play Russian roulette. If you study Torah and you study and you and you are true to Hashem and you you placed him before all things, and you're going to have the answers for this person. But if not, that then I'm going to put their blood on you. And that was the kind of test that was given. And so I I said to the private group, I said you you all need to be very vigilant, understand the importance of studying Torah every day, because one day you'll be you'll be faced where where the gun's been placed in your hand, whether you like it or not. And, and you need to know what, what to say, how to say, and you need to really understand Hashem and that moment to say the right things because it could be somebody's life. Nonetheless, this person got back to me and they saw God and they changed their mind about what they were going to do, so on and so forth. And uh, a bunch of people were asking, you know, what, 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 uh, what, what happened to this person? What happened to this person? So I told them, I said, a miracle occurred. I said, they saw God. And not even 10 minutes later, um, not even 10 minutes later after this, I, we had been looking for something completely ir not related to this Elon. Uh, but for some reason, this Elon had appeared and the person had reached out to me or the person reached out to me. We had a conversation and not the person that I had, I had, um, sent this message to somebody else. And, uh, in that moment, we had the opportunity. And so they reached out and immediately secured it and then sent it here. And this happened within 10 minutes of this person coming back to me. So I recognized it as a miracle. Now that Elon um, could very well be the only one in, in the world. I don't know if there are others in the world. I don't believe that there are. Um, I don't exactly know the entire story behind where it came from, but my understanding of the Elon um, is that, or at least this is what I think happened. Either the person had it and they received it from, you know, maybe their, their, um, you know, someone who passed away on their family, so on and so forth. And they just weren't into the Torah or they didn't study the Kabbalah or so on and so forth. And so they just didn't see the value or use of it. And that seems more likely what it could have been. Um, however, from, from what I could gather from it, the, that Elon was passed down quite a few times and it goes back to the Arizal and, wow. um, and it's a 24 karat gold, uh, Elon and it was engraved in it and, it, and it's five and a half feet long. And I shared it once on my TikTok, and it's truly a masterpiece. Um, so I'll actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and show it to you, but, um, it, because it had came into my possession, on the heels and i mean literally within 10 minutes of this incredible interaction with this woman who was going to basically kill herself and this child i recognized all of the different signs that were behind it so i ended up coming all the way from israel and um so i'll, I'll switch the camera to a moment So this is the Elon itself. You can see the the length of it. It's oh incredible. my goodness. It takes my breath away. It's incredibly. It takes my away as well. It's quite, it's truly something special. And uh how could can, somebody get rid of this? <laughs> I'll um, never under, it was meant for you, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I I I uh I view myself more as like a it's like caretaker for now. Yeah. Um because I I 
where as opposed to its owner, so on and so forth. I believe that it'll be passed down for many generations to come. Mm. And, and um and it's in it's 24 karat gold and it's in cut all the way through it's been engraved somehow i don't i don't know how they did that but it starts off with adam codmon and we can see at the top part here then it spreads down and it explains the emanation processes it starts off you know with Chesed Gavura. it talks about the lights it says or ain sof Baruch Hu. and then it shows the seven lights which were symbolic of the seven kings of adam and then it goes into the entire parts of themes. Um, one of the restrictions beneath this is the parts of theme of a reclined pin, so you could do Lago Bura. And then it goes beneath a reclined pin and then talks about um, the parts of theme of Zarain Pin, which we can see right here, the very tops of which it says parts of Abba, parts of Ima. It says parts of Israel Saba, which is right here, parts of um, Israel Tavuna. We have the actual parts of. of Zer. So this is his Kather Hulk Mabina Das, his Chesed and Gavura. So we can see connected to his Dar Das right here. It says Partsuf Leah. Down here, connected to his Tifra, it says Partsuf Rachel, Partsuf Yaakov. It opens up from his Esau. Then it says Olam Habria. And it has a, a listing of many different types of seraphim, so on and so forth. It says Olam Hayatsira. And then on the bottom, it says Olam Chasia. And then, and of course, this is, you know, all the different levels of God, all the planets and, and the Kochev and the Mazalot and so on and so forth. And on the very bottom right here, we have those of the Klipot. And it has all the names down, you know, Lili, so on and so forth. And interestingly enough, on the left-hand side, I actually have a Kamea that was written by um, Rav Kaduri. And uh, it essentially is an exact copy of this Elon. So we can see the entire parts of everything going all the way down, including the the clipa that was shown off there. So I've I've been planning on using it um as for videos and begin to uh teach from it, but I haven't had quite the opportunity to yet. Although that is something that I do plan on plan on incorporating in uh, very soon here. So I, I did manage to put a light behind it. So the light, um, when you cut the light on, it actually passes through the parts of it that the, that the gold was cut through and uh, it illuminates the letters. So you can, many of the, you can read it in light, almost like light words. Wow. Yeah. So I can't believe that story of how it came to you, it, blow, it blows me away. It really was a direct nod from God, truly. Um, there's, there's a helicopter circling above my house for like the past half hour that I keep coming in and out of mute because of the, sorry if you hear that background noise, hope everything is okay out there. Um, my next question really before I, I want to keep the video to a short amount of time so people will really watch this, but I do want to ask you if you're comfortable again, if you're not comfortable, don't answer, but where do you, did you learn from? How do you know all of this? <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good. uh That's a good question. It's uh, the million dollar question. You don't have to answer if you're not comfortable, but I figured <laughs> I'd try. So, um, I can get in a little bit to it. So, my my family, I I, I come from a a, a very long lineage. Um, that I was unaware of, uh, for the most part. So my, my great grandmother, um, survived the Holocaust and she fled, uh, from Italy. A lot of people think that the Holocaust was kind of localized only to Germany because that's where a lot of the, most of the tragedy occurred, but it wasn't just in Germany. There were, it, there were Jews were gathered in Italy as well. And, um, nonetheless, my, my great grandmother, she fled, and uh, my grandmother was the first one American. Now, my great-grandmother, she concealed our Jewish identity and uh, when she came over here to the States. And as uh, many people that survived the Holocaust uh, kind of um, concealed their Jewish identity and for obvious reasons why they would do that. And uh, so she raised my grandmother as normal as could possibly be, kind of sent her to, you know, like a, a Catholic boarding school and, 
And um, my grandmother never really uh, jived with Catholicism. So she ended up kind of stra strafing away from all of that when she was older. Mm -hmm. But she raised my mother relatively secular. So my mother was pretty much completely secular. Um, and as you can see, I'm tracing the lineage of my of my mother and my grandmother. Because in Judaism, we know that uh, that goes through the mother. Nonetheless, um, I would end up, so my mother would raise me. And it was relatively normal. Uh, upbringing however though I would fall uh, extraordinarily ill when I was 14 I was diagnosed with a an incredibly rare condition called superior mesenteric artery syndrome maybe I've only talked about this once in any of my videos but uh, it has a 33 percent fatality rate and I was absolutely crippled um, by this condition it's a stomach condition that has to deal with uh, the duodenum. And uh, I would be basically kept alive by a tube to my heart for about three, almost three and a half months. It was something called a pick line. Um, because when you have to be fed intravenously for that long, um, you can't be fed intravenously through uh, IVs or anything like that. I've fallen just incredibly ill. I was like nonstop vomiting, throwing up. I went from 138 pounds. And by the end of this, I was 92 pounds to put it into perspective. I was kept a, a like a children's hospital. So this all happened when I was 14. I was really young. And, um, and of course, you know, the last thing the doctor's like, oh, is, you know, I'm, I'm, any mother would ask, right? Does this, can this condition come back? And, and obviously the answer is the doctor told her, obviously, yes, this condition will have for the rest of his life. It's not something that can be cured with medication. It has to be something that's cured with a surgery. But the surgery that's done, um, I've never seen like a positive success rate on it. And it basically requires them, you know, like a 16 inch gash. If you look into the hit to that surgery, um, you basically have to take out all your insides and then put them back in and just kind of pray that everything goes well. But for the people that have had it done from what I've seen, they do not uh, end well. And so, um, so, so, you know, the doctor said, you know, he's lucky, you know, it doesn't come back by the time he's 18. And uh, because a lot of the people that suffer from this suffer from it acutely, which I would end up suffering it from it acutely. But nonetheless, you got to imagine 14 years old, that's way too much to have on a child's mind. And so basically, that's the equivalent of being given a death sentence. And so I would wonder, you know, when I would try to go back to school, um, I would really wouldn't be able to go back to school when I had been altered forever. Because uh, during the time that I was um, in the hospital, I wasn't allowed to have ice chips in my mouth, couldn't eat food, couldn't do anything. I, I'm on the surgical level, chosen hospital every day. I'm waking up. They're saying, you know, hey, you're, you're going to go to surgery today, kid. You're going to go to surgery, you're going to surgery. I mean, I heard it so many times. I don't even, I, I, I just lost track. Um, but I became uh, lost because uh, how do you tell a child, you know, that you, you basically have this condition that you're going to, that, that could kill you and uh, you're lucky to see 18. So when I went back to school, I became very depressed because I would hear people say like, Hey, I want to be a firefighter. You know, I'm going to be a lawyer. You know, I'm going to be a director. You know, I want to do this, I want to do that. And uh, I kind of wondered why God didn't like me for whatever reason or another. I basically became like, God, what, what did I do wrong that made you not care about me? Hmm. And that's, those are complex emotions for a child, but I, uh, that's where I was at. And so I, so I basically, I basically had a bucket list and I went to write out a huge bucket list of things that I wanted to accomplish and, and get done. And, and, um, I did end up accomplishing a lot of those things and getting them done. You know, I, people who have seen me, you know, they know that I have like a lot of ink, so on and so forth. And all of that came from that time period because I was basically given a death sentence in my mind. And so in my mind, there's this like countdown, you know, like this is, you have like guaranteed like this much to live. Like after that, there's no guarantee. So you need to do what you want to do while you have the time to do it. And, um, and so then finally I would become 18. And during that time period, I, I fell into another depression, obviously, because I, I wondered, you know, it's like, okay, I'm alive, but why am I alive? Like, what am I supposed to be doing here, God? Like, why, why do you have me here? What is the purpose? And, um, and I, I got to such a point, I got to such a point that I basically had messaged like every single person that 
I knew. And I said, you know, how was your day? And, I, and I'm at such a point in life, you know, I'm really cut off. I don't really communicate with a lot of people. And I'm definitely not communicating like what I'm actually experiencing or feeling. And nobody really understands what I'm actually going through unless the only way I could really describe it is like, is if it's like if you were given like a cancer diagnosis and somebody was like, yeah, you have terminal cancer. And if you, then they could understand what, I, what that's like and trying to communicate that and have somebody else understand that it, it, it's, it's too much. So I message every single person on my phone. I said, if one person messages me, then I mean it off to somebody. And so um, obviously nobody had sent me a message. And so, you know, I had planned exactly how I, I was tired of life. I was like, okay, well, then I'll take life on my own terms. And so I had, you know, I took like, like 550 milligram Tylenols. And so I took all these Tylenols and I was ready just to go to sleep and die. Because obviously, like, I didn't mean anything to God. I didn't mean anything to anyone around me. So I was done with life. And I'll end it on my own terms. Nonetheless, not obviously had other plans. So uh, I took all these pills. And somebody messages me. And they said to me, hey, uh, like, what's going on? Um, you know, do you need to talk? And then it was somebody I never would have thought in a million years would have messaged me. It was like a an acquaintance at best. And then one other person messaged me. Nonetheless, I held true to what I had said. And, um, you know, I went upstairs, let him know. I was like, hey, look, like I just might have made the worst mistake of my life. I just took all these Tylenols. I'm probably going to die. And they said, uh, you know, my uncle at the time said, hey, you should go to sleep. And I said, I, I, uh, I can't go to sleep. If I go to sleep, I die. Luckily, my aunt, took me fairly seriously at that time so she called the poison control they found out what i took and they're like no you need to get into a hospital so i go to a hospital you know they do the whole pumping your stomach and all that other stuff and 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 that entire time i'm listening to the doctor lecture me like you're stupid you're throwing your life away like you probably cause irreversible liver damage so on and so forth probably just cut your life into half doing what you did but i didn't really care about any of that because in my mind i'm already i already have this condition that's going to kill me anyway so it didn't change me Nonetheless, but I was in the hospital. I had an out-of-body experience and I was floating over my body. And I just remember saying, okay, I said, God, you know, why am I here? If you tell me why I'm here, then I'll live my life for you. Just show me that you're real. Show me something is real because everything in my life means nothing. What is, what is, what is life? And uh, so I would cleave on to that. And so then from that point forward, I, I started to take better care of myself, recover, heal, so on and so forth. And life would go on and a few years later i would end up inside of the desert and uh when i was out in the desert i was woken from my sleep by a voice and uh the voice i got up i wrote down it told me to write down the very first verse in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth so i went down and wrote down the beginning god created the heaven and the earth but it, the instinct on my heart was that i was supposed to write this in i was supposed to write this in hebrew I didn't know any Hebrew at the time. So I wrote it down in the most chicken scratch Hebrew that you could ever see. I wrote it down. And as I wrote it down, that voice came back and it projected a bunch of images. And the images showed all the correlations between the, what was going on in the verse. And um, that's, it called me by a specific name, which I've gone by ever since, even though ironically, this name would have been with me before even that. But nonetheless, um, so I, I, at the end of this, I would go to sleep. I'd wake up. I, I prayed. I was like, God, you never reveal yourself as a name. And it had given me a name or I had said it was a name. And it said its name was Ishmael, right? Crazy. So I, I pray. I was like, God, you never reveal yourself as a name. Like, what was that? Like, is that like a shadim? Like a demon? Like what's going on? And so nonetheless, I end up, uh, this happens on a Saturday. Uh, and so on Sunday, a guy named Yitzhak was there and he says, Hey, come with me to this church. Now, I've never, never been affiliated inside of a church or anything. And it's the first time this guy's offering me. So I'm like, okay, I, I prayed. I'll ask whatever. I'll follow this guy. Okay. We go to this church. Uh, it's the only time I ever went to this church. Nonetheless, I'm sitting there. I'm waiting for this time. Like, okay, what is this sign? And a guy comes up to me after and he, and he's, he says, my buddy, Alan told me to tell you, have you read the book of Ishmael? Immediately, I, I understood. 
So then from that, I left and I, be, I knew that whatever it was that I was showing, I needed to record. So I went to go find out how I was going to record so on and so forth. And I'd end up maybe two or three months later, I fell asleep and I had um, a divine dream. And in the dream, I woke up in this field of grass and it was under the moon's light. And there's this massive cloud of darkness before me. And out of the, I look up at this cloud of darkness and out of the cloud of darkness are opening all these eyes, eyes without number. And um, a voice had spoken from the midst of this cloud of darkness. And it said, listen, I'll show the things I'm going to show you. I fell on my face like a dead person. And I said in the dream, I said, this is the fear of God. And I was shown the upper worlds, how the things were interacting, Sefirot, Malachim, just everything you could possibly imagine. Well, this is way too much information. This was this was a lot to bear. And so I would end up going to two professionals. One of them was Dr. Rich Brown and one of them was Dr. Paul Clark. And uh, what they said happened to me was even more because I would tell them exactly what I, you know, I showed them what I was shown and told them exactly what I was told. And what they said happened to me was more uh, ridiculous than, than what I believed happened. So then therefore, um, this is obviously way too much for someone to understand uh, or, or to take all, take all this information in. And so I just needed some time to gather my thoughts in summary. And I'll speak just real briefly about this, but Dr. Rich Brown believed and these these are professors, you know, with PhDs, you know, obviously, because I, I I just can't go to anyone else. This is it's either like either this is something real or like I need to like I don't know <laughs> go go do something else, go on, go on a therapy retreat or something. I don't know, but <laughs> I think we we'll talk to a psychiatrist or something. Uh, nonetheless, um, Doctor Rich Brown believed that it was the patriarch Ishmael that had visited. And uh, which is obviously like, how do you accept this information, right? It's just too much. And he said, you, you must be blood related or something. And, and so he said, I won't go into all the details of what he said to me, but uh, uh, along the lines of uh, the patriarch Ishmael visited you because you're blood related. Um, Dr. Paul Clark thought something completely, completely amazing. Um, I'm still fascinated by what he had to say. And um, I won't get into the specifics of that. Maybe I'll save that for a special time. But there would be one other person that would that I would ask, and this person would say that it was it was Ishmael Cohen Gedal, Ishmael the high priest, the same one that that went to go have the uh, heavenly ascent of the Merkava, because the nature of the information that I was revealed could only have been revealed by you know such and such and such, and obviously I wasn't in a position of my own authority to be able to make sense of anything. They were could understand what I was saying, so so um, when I had came back. I'm just saying that's the whole book of Hanoch is Rabbi Ishmael's journey. Yeah, no, that and that's that's exactly what had happened was like I had ascended into the heavens and, and was shown all the different levels of the Malachim and I named all the levels of the angels and and what what they were doing and and what their roles were and and all of these different places and and, and you I, retain this information until today? You still have it? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I ended up writing it on ten pieces of papyrus. Uh -huh. And I still have those 10 pieces of papyrus. And that's, uh -huh. that's, and when I came back to, I saw everything. I saw Aleph separates men from Shin. Wow. I, I heard, I heard all of the words and I knew what they meant. All the letters and the arrangements that I, that's actually how I know all of these arrangements and all of these letters and how, and like those specific things. Cause I was showing them out there. And you're from the lineage of. So. <laughs> So are we, saying, are we gonna say or we're not gonna say? I'll 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 say it, I'll say it, but um I'm gonna just give like a like a like a clause of warning. Um, you know, I first when I first was told all this information, I had a first set off to disprove it. Um, so I was one hundred percent a skeptic before a believer in it. Nonetheless, um my grandmother was a first born American. And and so after this I would start to seek out, you know, like what's our family history, what's my family lineage. And so I would get a letter from, I found a letter from my great great aunt, and she basically tracked down a lot of our lineage and so on and so forth. And I would end up finding out that, um, you know, uh, that, that we have Jewish lineage and so on and so forth. And I would find out that my great, uh, uh, my my grandmother had told my mother before she died. My grandmother died in 1999. She had said that 
and this is crazy, it was before Dan Brown and all that other stuff, but she told my mother that we had came from the bloodline of Mary Magdalene. That's what she said. And my mother told me this and I had uh, not believed it. I completely disregarded it. Didn't think anything about it because I said, this is, this is absurd. And so I actually had set out to disprove it because I was like, this is going to be the easiest thing to disprove. So let me just go look up Jews in Sicily. There's obviously, I don't remember Sicily being associated with Judaism whatsoever. So I looked up Jews in Sicily and it comes to find out that if you go and look at the Jews in Sicily and look at the ancient history, you find that during the fall of the second temple, that the Romans were using Sicily as a slave island hmm. and that apparently they had taken Jews, which would have been the tribe of Judah from the second temple period. They would have taken the Jews that they, after they destroyed the second temple and sacked Jerusalem, they took some of them into Sicily as slaves, as slaves. And so this is the time where, uh, you know, Mary Magdalene, so on and so forth, those types of characters would have been alive and they would have been alive in that specific place at that specific time. So if she was in Jerusalem at that time or any lineage of her was in Jerusalem at that time and they were um, captured by the Romans, they could have entirely have been placed in Sicily because Sicily was a, an island and they used it as, as a slave island. And so then therefore, unfortunately, when I had first set off to disprove what they, what my grandmother had said to my mother, I ended up only realizing that it was possibly true that what she had said. And, um, and so in fact, I, I've paid it no regard up to this point. Uh, I, I tried not to pay any attention to it because that's where the original tribe of Judah would have been. But nonetheless, that is where the relevancy do, th does go into play. Now there was a lot of very interesting things I did learn about my family history or a lot of Kabbalists and, so on and so forth. And then when you look at the, tra the, the, the travels, for example, Rabbi Akiba had traveled to Sicily and uh, um, Chaim Vital, um, uh, later disciple, um, later disciples ended up going to Sicily, so on and so forth. And so there's a, a lot of ancient uh, Jewish lineage there in a place where I thought there wasn't any Jewish lineage. So it makes so a lot Mary, of Mary Magdalene was a Jewish woman from mm -hmm. the tribe of Judah. So there was, yes, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot to that. And so, um, so, you know, one of my brothers would, would introduce me and in, in some of his safers as my Merovingian brother. And, uh, you know, the Merovingians, I didn't know exactly what that was. So I looked into it, but apparently, you know, it's just kind of like a keyword for, you know, some bloodline. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I tried not to look too much deep into or pay too much credence to it, despite the fact that my grandmother did say specifically this. Um, so after, after these experiences would happen, I would be blessed to come into contact with, um, uh, some very great Kabbalists. One Kabbalist goes back to all the way back to, um, uh, ancient Spain in the lineage of Abraham Abulafia mm -hmm. and an amazing Spanish Kabbalist. And, uh, he would basically initiate me formally into all of the, the ancient Kabbalah before, um, the Zohar. And then I would be, um, I met two other great Kabbalists, one in Jerusalem and another Kabbalist that um, also came from another Spanish bloodline. And um, that Kabbalist was probably the only person in, uh, in, in the history of, um, probably the history of humanity who have ever translated the entire Tikkun Zohar into English. And he translated a bunch of other safers, which I had a privilege of, of, of uh, learning and being a part of and, and being initiated in, in the highest 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 mysteries of not just jewish kabbalah but the superseding kabbalah i i don't, I don't like using the term like i use the term gnosticism because it's not really gnosticism but it's not normal kabbalah either it's like a secret kabbalah and then i uh then from the 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 kabbalist that was in jerusalem um they they instructed me formally in lurianic kabbalah so on and so forth and so then, therefore, from the combination of all of these different things, I was able to make clear sense of everything that I, I've been instructed in. And from there, I, I went into the process of just laying all this information down, writing the elons, writing the scrolls, writing the books. 
so on and so forth. And then, and that's where it's all come down to. And so for the last decade of my life or so, my life has been completely contingent. Like though my only source of study, for example, for the most part has been strictly Zohar. You know, we study Zohar every day at, at noon and noon, as you know, for many, 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 many years. I feel like 80% of my brain is Zohar. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the rest of it's like the Lurianic writings. And then I have other secret writings that um, most of the Western world isn't, isn't really aware of. But yeah. So you're totally immersed right now. Your life is immersed in, in Zohar. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. How old are you now? Can I ask that? 32. Wow, yeah. yeah. All the great Kabbalists were very young, you know. Yeah. We should yeah. live a long, long, long life. We should we should should have eternal life in this body without have sake. We should well, when I, yeah. When I was when I was twenty five, uh when I was twenty five I felt very ill again. And uh they wanted to put a feeding tube in my stomach. And I was actually scheduled for the surgery and everything, and I didn't go. Um, mainly because I felt like that would be my death and it probably would have been. But yeah, you're right. Um, so that saying in the beginning of the Zohar where it says you must live your life as if as if the, the world depends on you is very true. And then similarly, I understood um, what it meant regarding Moshe Rabbeinu where he says, where he says he was sickly. He was, he was the most meek person in the world. He's very sickly, very weak. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. But so, your, your health is pretty stable now? Uh, it'll never be stable. I, I don't know what healthy feels like, but <laughs> I've, I'll, I'll be sickly the rest of my life. But I, uh, but you'll be I, healed. You, we're all going to be healed soon. For sure, for sure. Well, I feel. I, I mean, I feel spiritually like I'm like I'm. I'm the healthiest I've ever been. Excellent. And and, and so then, therefore, the light that I was shown, especially Aleph separates men from Shin, which is a key, the first key of all of that, is something that I've been diligent to share and diligent to. Um, reveal to everybody because it's I believe that that's the center to Tikkun Alam and so the voice that's spoken from the cloud of darkness which said go show these things that's one of the things that I was referring to was this concept of seeing Elo separates one from Shin because that light is uh, what unites everything ultimately and allows God to be revealed and so I understood everything that he re that was revealed to me at that time as um, basically what I need to to reveal in Tikkun Alam, Hashem says, "I reveal to my, I reveal myself to my prophets in a vision and a dream." And so, the vision I understood to be when I was awake, and the dream is when I was asleep. And I had an incident when I was awake and an incident when I was asleep. So I interpreted it to, and so since then I've been, I've, you know, I've, I've, nothing will kind of deter me away from that because, um, it's not going to be outside sources that fix everything it's not going to be like it won't be wars and it won't be fighting but it'll be that which unites everything it'll be uh shem the divine that'll be the only thing that fixes our our situation here in this world through the letters yeah through the letters specifically yeah so oh, thank you yeah absolutely well that was that was quite a bit there i usually don't i usually don't i'm so honored i really thank you for sharing your story and it just makes you feel more human and more relatable because you're so brilliant i wanted to bring the human side also um and i'm grateful that you had the courage to share the visions and to act on what was given to you and to break it down and give it to us yeah absolutely absolutely and and ultimately and for you guys to others you know i feel that that's one of the major one of the major keys uh, that will occur in the future is that uh, that you, you you read the section in Isaiah regarding where the uh, origin or restoration of the reach comes from? Yes. And it says those that will be of that light. It doesn't say that light. It says those that will be of that light will build up the old waste places. I interpreted that as the people that will receive the information because you can you can kill people, but you can't kill ideas. Right. And you can't kill information. Information is eternal. <laughs> so I I interpreted that as as ultimately you all and you know the listeners and and the other people that will really see this type of information and ultimately take it as their own and run with it because 
that's what it is because Hashem, the light of Hashem, the truth of Hashem is not something that's limited to any any one place or any one person. But rather, it's it's the legacy or the gift of of everybody. It's the it's the legacy of all humanity. So I feel that all humanity should have the right to be able to receive it and take it to their own. Beautiful. I'm going to put your links in the description box so people know where to find you. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you ever want to go, go into some of the other De Classical Kabbalah, definitely feel free to reach out. Thank you for having me. In, uh, Absolutely. In I would love to have many more discussions like this and spread the wisdom. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I know we've been on here for a little while, so I'll let you get, uh, I'll let you wrap everything up here and then, uh, God willing, we will meet again very soon here. Amen. Oh, Thank you so much, Yura. Of course, to you as well.